God for uh, this wonderful opportunity to sit at your feet, to hear you uh, speak, oh God. I pray that you would just help us to hear from you, oh God, this morning, that we might uh, apply those things which we hear. Uh, may they become a part of our lives. May we, may we be forever changed, having been in your presence, oh God, here this morning. Teach us, O oh God, we pray. Show us, O oh God, we pray. Uh, do a supernatural work in our midst, O oh God, we pray. And we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, we're going to be, actually, this morning, we're going to be finishing up the Gospel of John. It's, I know it's been a long, um, it's been a long road. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, road that we've been on with the Gospel of John. Uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. I think one of the biggest things that um, I think we've learned here is that uh, Jesus is God. He's the one who comes in the flesh. And the Gospel, the Gospel of John is about Jesus and who Jesus is. Um, but we're going to be reading a scripture passage. We're going to be reading verses um, 18 through, uh, through the end of the chapter, verse 20, chapter 21, um, uh, 18 through 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to them, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. And the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore the saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that could be written. Now think about, when I think about my own life, again, is that I... You think as a, as, a, as a child, as a young adult, um, I used to think I was in control. I, whatever I did, I kind of made the decision that I was going to do it. And I used to think that the decisions I made and choices I made were going to benefit me or help me in some way or form. And basically, I was my own person. Yes, I had parents over me. Yes, I had people that guided me. Yes, I had people that directed me. But yes, in my own mind, in my own heart, I was thinking that I was kind of doing what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And especially as I became an adult and I became more independent, I used to think that I was in control and I would do things the way I thought they, excuse me, I thought that they should be done. And the reality was is that ultimately I began to understand that it wasn't me. I being in control, but the reality was, ultimately, it was God who was really in control of my life. And then as I became a Christian, I became more and more aware of what was going on, then I realized that it was God who was ultimately in control of my life. But then as I became more mature, God showed me the reality of what his plan was, the reality of what his purpose was for my life and what he was calling me to do, and and he was telling me, John, you need to follow me. But what it was showing me was, is that he was in control. Even from when the point from when I was young, all the way up until as an adult, and even my future was in his hands. But the reality was, just because I didn't understand my future, or maybe I didn't, maybe didn't always necessarily agree with it, he said, you need to follow me. I'm in control, and I'll take care of you. And the point was, is that he showed me that he was in control, I'll take care of you, and you don't need to worry about anything else. Also, he was showing me that I needed to trust him in his word. If he said his word is true, I needed to trust him. 
and I needed to trust him that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And then finally, in my own life, he was showing me that if his, um, there were things that he was going to do in my life that maybe weren't, were going to be a testimony to his work, the reality of his work, because it wasn't necessarily written here, doesn't mean that it wasn't from Jesus. But that it was a reality of an ongoing work that Jesus was doing in my life. And so we're going to find out more about that today. The reality is, is that, it, that God is real, that, he, that he's been active in our life, that his word and his promises are real, and that um, he's going to, he has a wonderful plan and a purpose for us in our lives. And he wants to accomplish things. He is doing things in our lives that we don't even realize are from him. But let's go on, let's go on here. We're going to look at three things here. Uh, verses 18 to 23, we're going to look at that our times are in his hands. The, uh, two is a disciple who testifies. Three is that many other things which Jesus did. Our times, our times are in his hands. Uh, Jesus knows about Peter's whole life. Um, if you look at verse 18, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. Peter, Peter, I think, is becoming at this place where he understands that Jesus knew about his life. Jesus, Peter, Jesus always spoke to Peter and spoke into his life. And Jesus, and Peter started to realize that Jesus knew all about Peter even before they even met. He knew about Peter even when he was a young kid, even when he was a young child, because he was God. He created him. He created Peter. He saw his whole life from day one. And Jesus, and, and, and Jesus and Peter was telling Peter, says, when you were young, you used to walk around, you used to do such and such, you used to do this, you used to do that, and, this is, and you did whatever you thought you wanted to do. And what Jesus was saying was, I knew that. I was still in control. I was still aware of what was going on in your life at that moment when you were when you were born and the, and the reality was is that um, he Peter didn't uh, I think fully understand that but he was coming to an understanding of that and now that Jesus knew about his whole life Peter Jesus says but when you grow old you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. So, and then, and see, God, it says, God will, God will allow this to happen to Peter to show that he's in control and that his plan and his purpose will be accomplished in his life. And what Jesus was saying to Peter was, is that he was saying this to Peter to signify what kind of death he was going to incur. He was saying that Peter, Jesus was saying that Peter, you're going to suffer for my name's sake. Someone's going to take you, and they're going to take you where you do not want to go. They're going to take you to a place where you're going to suffer for my name, where you're going to um, you're going to testify for me, but you're going to suffer. But you're going to. This is all a part of my plan for you. And so the reality was that. Not only did Jesus know Peter, he was saying that Jesus knew Peter in his life before, and what he was doing, and Peter's thinking that he was in control, that now Jesus is saying, Peter, you're going to go, someone else is going to lead you, and you're going to go to a place where you do not want to force you to go. And it may be hard. But Jesus was saying, I'm in control. I know your whole life, Peter. I got it all mapped out, Peter. I got it all planned out, Peter. I know what I'm doing. I knew your life before, I know your life now. We're gonna all, it's all gonna to work together. But if you look at verse, um, if you, and, and it says, and, and verse 19 says, now he said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And actually, how did Peter die? I shared this last week, was he actually was, um, he went to Rome and he was crucified on a cross. He says, I'm not worthy to be crucified by the same by the way my Lord was, so they crucified him upside down. 
That's what history has. That's not biblical. That's not in the Bible. But that's what, according to uh, historians, that's the way Peter had died. He died upside down, feeling, saying that he was not worthy. But the reality was, knowing that Jesus had spoken this, Peter, what was the command that Jesus gave Peter? And in, in verse, at the end of verse 19, it says, He said this, he said to him, Follow me. Knowing that Peter, knowing that this, the road that was going to be before him may not be an easy one. If you're going to go and proclaim, you're going to be my apostle, and you're going to go and proclaim my word, and you're going to go and live for me, and, and, and do for me what I have called you to do, and that road may not be easy, and that road gonna, it's gonna, uh, may mean persecution, whatever that road is, for you, whatever that road is for you, Peter, you still must follow me. That means to follow after him. Whatever instruction he has, whatever direction he gives, whatever he says, you must do. Just like being in the military. I was never in the military. My dad was. But the reality was, my dad used to tell me, if, the, if his superior told him to do something, no matter how difficult it was, he, was, he better, by, by George, he better do it. And that's basically what Jesus was saying to Peter. He's saying, Peter, even though these things are coming, and I know your life, I know the plan that I have, it's still a good plan. It may, it may be difficult, but you're going to follow me. Follow me. In other words, he's given Peter the choice to follow him. And it's not that Jesus is being masochistic at all. But the reality is, is that Jesus knows what is for Peter, what's in store for Peter. Is, and whatever he has in store for Peter is a good plan for him, even though it may be difficult. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad because there's difficulty or suffering in that. It just means that it's God's plan for him, and that he must follow in God's plan for him. Now that's the reality for Peter. But let's go on here. And, that, and that it shows that um, whatever I tell you to do, However I tell you to do it, wherever I send you, why? Because I said so, and I'm in control. Even if you don't like it or you don't understand. And Peter, I'm sure, didn't fully understand it. But even though because he didn't understand it, doesn't mean he shouldn't do it. And that's where faith comes in sometimes. If God tells us to do something, we don't understand it. It doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do it. But then we just need to, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do it, but... You just gotta give me direction. I'll still do it. And this is so important because it, it tells us here that it says, Peter turning around, verse 20, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter seeing him said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? And so Peter is basically seeing John. This is he's talking about John there, the one who's following him, because they were like the they, they were like the inner three with Peter, James, and John. They were like the closest ones to Jesus. And so John is Jesus is having this moment with with Peter, and John is like because he likes John is just so close to Jesus he just wants to be there. He wasn't. I don't think he was being nosy. It was just. He, and, and he wanted he wanted to be close to Jesus. So the reality was is that Peter turns around and says, "Hey Lord, well what about him?" And, she, and Peter knows the road that God has for him and what God has called him to do, and it may include suffering. And so Peter doesn't want doesn't want to be singled out, doesn't want to be left out. He says, well, "What about him?" And so often that's what Peter was looking for. So that he could have, not he wasn't just looking at his own. Peter was looking at, oh, I'm just gonna. Well, if I have to go through this, well, what about him? Shouldn't he have to go through that as well? Basically, that's what he was saying. Basically, that's what he was saying. And here's what Jesus had to say. Jesus is just so wise and he's so perfect. And Jesus, and Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Basically, what Jesus was saying to Peter was, John is none of your business. 
That's if I have if I want him to remain until I come, that's none of your business. It's your job to do what I tell you to do and you follow me. Of course he said it in a loving way, he said it in a firm way, but he said it in a loving way as well. Don't worry about John. In other words, I, I got a plan for John. If I want him around until I come, that's my plan for John. You don't worry about my plan for John. You worry about, no, you don't want to worry, but you just trust me for your plan for your life. Don't worry about what, other, what God has for someone else. That's not what I have. And just because my, my, my plan isn't any less for you than it is for him. It's just different. And that's, what God, and that's what Jesus was trying to convey to Peter, is that my plan for John is different from your, the plan I have for you. Because John didn't die a martyr's death. John suffered. Yeah, they, they, they exiled him to the island of Patmos. John, John died probably in his 90s. He's a very old man. And that's where he penned the book of Revelation, was on the island of Patmos, when he was a very old man. That was probably the, the, the last book of the New Testament that was penned. And the reality was, is that John didn't go out the same way Peter did. But that was because that wasn't the same plan for John as it was for Peter. Now, there's his, history, historians will say, there's a history that John was put in a, box, a, a vat of boiling oil and he, and, he, and he came out and he survived. That's not biblical, but that's history, that he survived that. That's what the historians have said about John when he, and he, as he suffered for his faith. But the reality was, John's plan and Peter's plan were two separate things, and he didn't need to worry about what was God's plan for, for John. Um, and, and I think that that's so important um, not to worry, because Peter was trying to find some peace for himself. The reality was, Jesus said, don't worry about it, just trust me. My plan is a good plan for you. My plan is a good plan for you, just trust me. Um, and let's look at um, verse, go on here, let's get down to verse, um, verse 24. It says, this is the disciple who has testified to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Who is this disciple? The disciple is John. It's the book that's named after him. And it says, John testifies to this and wrote all these things. Um, and it says it's a, he's a credible witness. John's readers who know John and John himself knows that this testimony is true. In other words, his word is true. In other words, the readers who would read this letter or this gospel would know that the testimony of John is a credible testimony. So what he's saying here, they knew that was it could be it's believable. It's something that's true. It's something that's reliable. It's something that's trustworthy. So the, those who ever read that knew the testimony of John. They knew that whatever is said here could be tried upon, could be relied upon. And it's not a lie. It's not a fabrication. It's not an extension of the truth. But the reality is, it's the truth. And so the readers will know that. John knows that. Because John was right there with Jesus. John was right there um, uh, with Jesus the whole time. And so he's not lying. He's telling the truth. And so whatever is said here in this gospel, you can trust, and it can be sure, and it can be relied upon, and it can be uh, the truth that you can depend on. I'm not telling you a lie, basically, is what Jesus is saying to his readers. This is not a lie. This is the truth. This is John. You know me. This is John, and I tell you the truth. This is what you can rely on this truth. And then it goes on here. Um, there's many other things in verse 25. There are so many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even... The world itself would not contain the books that would be written. If you look at um, verses, uh, if you look at chapter 20, let's skip back to chapter 20, verse 30. And this is an important verse. 
And it says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So this goes back to what is being said here. That um, just because Jesus had done many, so many things. There's things that are recorded here in John that Jesus did. A lot of things, a lot of miracles, a lot of sayings, a lot of teachings, a lot of encounters with other people that are written here in John. But what John is saying here is that there was many other things that Jesus did that are not written in here. That if there, there wouldn't be enough books in the whole world to contain all the things that Jesus did. Now what does that mean? That means that Jesus' individual encounters with people. Jesus' words that he spoke, spoke along the road to somebody that would touch your lives. It's maybe not included in here. Um, the healings that he brought. Um, the words that he spoke that brought healing to people that are not recorded here. The countless people of healing that maybe was brought in someone's life, in their mind, in their heart, in their soul, in their body, in their experience, by them coming to salvation, that are not recorded here. And, there, and, there's, and, there's, and there's countless, countless numbers of people that Jesus had encounters with, that Jesus had, um, uh, that he could, um, that were not written down, but they, they could fill volumes even more than could possibly be written. But not only but through Jesus, but that would be done through the apostles and those who would come after the apostles and those who would come after them, all the way down to us. All the things that are not written down here, but that because of what Jesus had done and he spoke to them and to the lives of other people, they passed down to other people and then they saw the work of Jesus. And then they saw the works of Jesus. And the others saw the works of Jesus. And so it goes on and on and on until today. And so therefore, there's no way that all those things could have been recorded in all the books in the world. Think about the countless times that Jesus has the, the works of salvation to those throughout the, the centuries and throughout the millenniums that have come to know Christ because of what he did back here during his time, during his time written in the gospel. That's what he means by that. And it carries on, and the work carries on, and the work carries on. So the reality is, is that um, it's a work that is ongoing, that's, that's living, that's active, that goes beyond just a, a, a period of time, but goes through on throughout all eternity. It goes from the time that he did it until the time when we all go home to be with him to heaven. That's the testimony that we don't see written down in the word of God, but we hear in the lives of people as a result of what Jesus did back here. Because it all goes past down. It all goes down little by little by little by little. I can think of the countless times where... Um, it uh, looks around the world and see where nations, where peoples and individuals and nations and miracles and situations and circumstances are different and change because of what Jesus did back here. But you won't see that written here in the Bible. But it doesn't mean because it's not written here, it doesn't mean it didn't happen in the lives of people because it's written in the hearts of men. And that's what John is trying to say here. And the reality is, is that Jesus' work is ongoing. Um, and I think it's, people don't always understand that. That God's work, his word, is ongoing. His work is uh, a continuous work. It's not a stagnant work, but it's a continuous work. Um, his word is continu uh, let's look at um, uh, Hebrews 4.12 and it goes on here and it says in Hebrews 4.12 is that it 
said for his, the word of God. And this is, this is talking about his spoken word. But it's also talking about his, his word that he had spoken. In other words, back then, that continues even today. It, goes, it says in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So in other words, the words that Jesus spoke are living and active. Living, that, living means it's not dead. It just didn't happen back here. But it's ongoing, and it continues, and it and it, and it flows, and it goes, even in it's active in our lives, and living in our lives today. And even those things that Jesus are not written down here in the Bible, but the things, his word that he spoke to people, even back then, and taught his disciples, are now come, been passed down to us, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the work of the Holy Spirit. And now we're, here we are today. And we'll continue to do so until he comes. Until he comes back uh, to take us home. And so, but as I, as I look at this, I think the reality is, is that God is in control. Um, when we were younger, we thought that we were ultimately in control in our lives. We would make decisions and choices that we thought were best for us, doing what we wanted to do. And, but in reality, if you look back, if we look back at our lives, we understand that Jesus was in control. If you really think about your life, and you really think about what was going on in your life, and what's happening in your life, you come to realize, you come to understand that he was ultimately in control of your life. I think about... I think about the decisions and choices I make. Some were better than others, and some were not so much so as good. But the reality was I understood and I knew that he was ultimately in control where I thought I was. I thought, you know, I was, I was have, as a kid, I was going to have fun driving my brother's go-kart down an alleyway with some of my other kids having fun. And I thought I was going to have a joy ride. And I didn't realize that there was a car coming around the corner. The go-kart sits only maybe about four inches off the ground. And the car and the car comes up, comes around the corner, and, and comes up this little hill. And I was going the way the car was coming this way, it's coming around the corner, going like this. I went up the hill and I was going straight for the car. And the car stopped in time. And I was looking at the front bumper. Like my eyes were literally right where the front bumper was. Now, I thought I was in control. The reality was, is that God was in control the whole time. I made my choices, I made my decisions, but ultimately, God was in control. Then, as we go, and, and, and then we go on further, is that we look at our own lives. And, I, and, I look, uh, and we see what God has planned for us. God has an individual plan for each one of us that he wants us to fulfill. That individual plan is different from anyone else's. Um, my plan, God's plan for my life is different from you, his plan for your life. And so forth. But it doesn't mean that, my, that God's plan for my life is any different or any better than His plan for your life. God's plan for my life may have may be more difficult or more trying, or maybe um, or maybe uh, something may not be quite as challenging, maybe more challenging. But that's what God that's what God has called me to do. That's His plan. That's His purpose for me. And, that, and what he's telling me is that, John, you need to follow me. And whatever God's plan is for you, and what God has shown you, is that you need to follow him. Whether it's a difficult 
whether it's it's difficult or whether it's it's uh, it's you know it's it's more of a uh, where there's not as much suffering. I don't know. God only you know what God's plan is for your life. But whatever it is, whether it's difficult or whether it's got suffering or whether it, it may not have as much suffering, whatever it is, you still need to follow God in that. And often what happens is that we don't when God tells us something we get because we don't understand we don't understand it, but we get afraid, we shy away from it and says, No God, I won't do that. And we end up being disobedient to God. We end up not doing what God has for us. And we end up missing out on the blessing that God has for us. But the reality is if God's gifted us and God has shown us and God wants us to do something, then we need to do it. Follow me. Whatever it is. And then but sometimes we'll say, well, what about him? What about him? What about this person? What about this person? What about this person? We do that. We're human, don't we? Just like Peter. But what about him? That's not fair, God. I had my son say to me, I was doing something with my son the other day. And I was doing something with him. And then he goes around and he says, well, what about him? That's not fair. That's basically what Peter was saying. He was. And we do. We're human, don't we? But the reality is we cannot look at other people's lives and other people's plans. Because that's not what God has for us. We can't. Not even individually, but even as a church. We're Crescent Bible Church. And God has a plan for Crescent Bible Church. He has a purpose for Crescent Bible Church. We can't look at, we dare not look at what God is doing in another church. And say, God, what about them? Why is that church... Why is that church such and such? Or why is that church big? And we're not growing as much. Why, 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 why? Because we're always looking at the grass is greener on the other side. Right. We do it individually for ourselves and what God, what God's doing in someone else's life. And we do it uh, even as a church and churches. I hear, I hear that all the time. And the reality is, is that it doesn't matter what God's doing over there, or what God's doing in that person's life. You follow me. You do what God's called you to do here, in your life. Do what I've called you to do. You can, as John says here, he says, you can trust my word. My words are true. The Bible is true. His promises are yea and amen. They're yea and amen. In other words, they're yes and amen. It's going to happen. You can trust his word. One thing I learned in seminary that I'll never forget, that I could never, that has stuck with me from day one, if I learned one thing in seminary, was is that this book is wholly reliable, without error, without contradiction, without hypocrisy, and you can trust it wholeheartedly. And there is no incongruities, there is no wrong thing in this word. There isn't. Nothing. And so what John was saying was, you can trust my word wholeheartedly. You can trust what I say wholeheartedly. You don't have to doubt it. So what, when I say this is my plan for you, you trust it. When, when, when I show you promises in my word, you trust it. This is my plan for you. And you trust it. You trust them. You trust them. And then also is that, if you, and then lastly is that um, the testimonies that he is doing and the work he's doing in our life, the work that he's doing in our life, goes beyond what's written down here. The Apostle Paul says in, um, I think at first it's um, Corinthians chapter, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. It says, and this is, a, this is an excellent, excellent verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. It says that, basically what he's saying is, is that, uh, here we go. It says, um, no, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, 
says, 2 Corinthians 3, 2, it says, You are a letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. In other words, the test, you are our letter. In other words, you are our epistle. Letter means epistle. You are a letter written and known of men and read by all men. In other words, the work that's not necessarily written in here is what? It's written in your heart. Because it's a living word, isn't it? That the things that were maybe not written down here and that Jesus has done, but that are ongoing and that are in our lives now. So we are living epistles. In other words, God's word and the work that Jesus has done, the work that Jesus has spoken, is written in our hearts. So the people, when people look at our lives, what do they see? They're seeing the living word here. Living epistles. So people can see, when they look at John Williams, they see his life. And they, and they, and they hear his word, and they see his testimony. Even though he isn't perfect, they can still see Jesus, right? And they say about that for each one of us. Because remember, God's word is living. And God's work is living. And it's active. And so when people look at us and say, what's different about you? I remember I was working at a job in Lake City. I was working at a medical clinic at a homeless shelter in Lake City. And I remember I was working at this clinic. And the, and the woman who said this was a really brash, really outspoken, very tough, 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 tough cookie. She was, very, she was just a real tough cookie. Very competent person, but she, she was just a real tough cookie. And, um, and she says, and she asked me one day, and she says, John, what's different about you? What's different about your life? I didn't say a word. I mean, I, I mean prior to that, I didn't say, oh, oh, your life, you're different. What makes you different? And the reality was it's because Christ was written on my heart. He's written in my life. His living, active word that's not necessarily written here because all the books couldn't contain all those things. But it's written here on my heart. So what's the testimony of this gospel, the gospel of John, what's the testimony of your life? What's the testimony of your walk? What's the testimony of your life speaking? i, I, I give you a good example. There's St. Thomas Aquinas. There's an old saying. He was, um, he said, it says, um, preach Christ at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now think about that. Preach Christ at all times, and if necessary, use words. And what he's saying was, is your life is a testimony, that living testimony. And so that's what we, and that's what we have. So he knows our life, he's got that plan for our life. He's got the work that he wants to do in our life. Can't worry about what he's doing with other people. We can trust his word. And that his word is living and active and ongoing in our lives in a powerful way. Amen? Amen. Jesus knew that Peter was an integral part of his church that Jesus was building and leaving behind for the disciples to carry on after he ascended into heaven. But he also needed to have Peter um, restored and healed. So that he could come to a place where he could be the leader of the church that he needed to be. But Peter needed to have some healing first before that could happen. And restoration first. And Jesus did it in such a way, in such a manner, that enabled Peter to be restored. Jesus could have used really harsh words, he could have used really disappointing words before he put somebody down. Thank you.